All right, thank you um, for the opportunity to speak to you today. So I'm gonna talk for a few minutes about uh, weed management and strawberries. And just to could put a few kind of qualifiers on here, I'm gonna summarize what we do in Florida for, for weed management. So that means everything that I'm talking about is in regards to plastic culture production. Although a lot of the techniques do go beyond that. Um, I'm gonna kind of frame this around an integrated weed management program because one thing we have found is that no single tool will solve the problem, but you've got to integrate a bunch of them. So I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on some components of this than others. But uh, we're gonna highlight some of the things we found the last few years, but also highlight kind of the standard practices here in Florida. So to start with, um, we're gonna start with fumigation. The vast majority of strawberries in Florida are fumigated. We do have around anywhere from six to 800 acres of organic strawberries um, in the county where I'm at, which is Hillsborough County. And that kind of varies depend from year to year, depending on the market. But as far as fumigation goes, we just completed a management survey of a short while ago. And the most common fumigant in Florida and strawberries is Piclor 60. And that's commonly thought of for control of pathogens and nematodes. It does provide some weed control as well, which I'll talk about a little bit in a minute. Telone C35 used to be the most common fumigant, but it's no longer as common as Piclor 60. And then there are a few growers that use KPAM or VAPAM as well, which its strong point is weed control. The, one of the reasons that we use these combinations of telone and chloropicrin is because of the fact in terms of weed control, they're much more effective when combined. Now these pictures I'm gonna show you, the next couple of pictures are in tomatoes, but you see the same trend in strawberries. So the picture on the left is your non-treated and you can see nut sedge coming through the plastic here. If you add 50 pounds of chloropicrin, 50 pounds of pick, you actually make the problem worse. And that's because low levels of pick will stimulate nut sedge sprouting. If you get up around 200 pounds of pick, well, then you've certainly reduced the population compared to a non-treated, but you don't get great control. If you look at same picture on the left is untreated, in the middle, that's still 50 pounds of pick, but the picture on the right, now this is 15 gallons per acre of one 3D. It essentially doesn't have any effect on that sedge control on its own, but this is where you really see the difference. Once you combine the pick and the one 3D, you see a really clean bed and it's that combination of products that gives optimizes weed control. And we see that consistently across all crops and um, the, that combination improves control. Now, here is a key point though, is it's really weather dependent. So those pictures that I'm showing you where we get really good control of nut sedge, those are fumigated in January in Florida. So that's when the soil's a bit cooler. If you look at this picture on the left is Piclor 60 and on the right is non fumigated, almost no difference. Those are fumigated in July when it's really hot. So we, for weed control, when it comes to fumigation, you have to take into account whether cooler, slightly cooler soils are gonna give you better weed control just because the fumigant moves through the soil more slowly. We've done a lot of long-term fumigation trials the last few years. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this because fumigation is not kind of where I want to spend all the time. But I do want to point out this picture to give you an example. On the left is non-fumigated. On the right is Piclor 60. And again, on the left is non-fumigated. On the right is the Florida three-way. What we call the Florida three-way is a combination. So in this case, Piclor 60 plus KPAM on the top. And early in the season, you don't see a lot of, a lot of difference. But when you move through um, late in the season, you see where we didn't fumigate, we just got hammered with disease. Piclor 60 did fairly well, but there's a lot of variability in those plants. If you look at this three-way picture on the right, you see consistency. Just to show you another picture of how extreme this can be, we don't use paladin anymore, but this still shows you the difference of the Florida three-way versus not. The bottom left-hand picture, that's paladin pick 21. You can see all those grasses and broadleaf weeds growing in there. This is the same field. Here we have Paladin plus KPAM, and you can see how much cleaner it is. So consistently, if we have a problem field that's gonna be fumigated, that has a lot of weeds, the, the Florida three-way or what in Georgia they call it, the Georgia three-way, 
that combination gives you the best control. And in our studies, it actually gives you the best economic return as well. So real quick, use combinations if you fumigate. Cooler temperatures are gonna give you better weed control. The floor of three ways, the best in terms of weed control as well as economic return. And it's the best in terms of broadleaf and grass control as well. When it comes to herbicides, so I'm gonna talk about some pre herbicides, pre-emergence herbicides, the ones that you apply before the weeds are up. So in, our, in Florida, we're gonna talk about herbicides that go underneath the plastic mulch. So you can have this equipment you can see here, which is a bed press, which has nozzles on the back, which can spray the herbicide directly on the bed immediately before we lay the plastic. This is not a real common practice in Florida. Not a lot of people are using herbicides under the plastic. It does occur especially in fields where there are um, problems with broadleaf and grass weeds. Here is a summary of the most common herbicides used in Florida. Historically, the recommendation was a combination of Gold and Devernal. Uh, we've moved away from that. Chateau is now the most common recommendation. And there's a few reasons for that. If you look down, this is just a few weed species that we have in Florida strawberries. And black medic and care of the line of geranium are two common ones. You see Chateau provides some suppression of those two species, whereas the other do, two products do not. Um, generally speaking, Chateau persists a little longer um, and provides really good, excellent weed control of most species, a little bit better than Gold, although Gold is also a very good product. You might be wondering why historically would they have mixed Gold and Devernal? Well, that's simply this next chart shows it. Devernal is much better on grasses than Chateau or Gold. So that Gold plus Devernal mix gave you a better um, over, overall weed control. However, Chateau is pretty decent, better than Gold on grasses. And the last price that I did, which was admittedly a little over a year ago, but it was, so prices changed a lot. But at the time, uh, Chateau was at around $20 per acre. A gold Devernal mix costs around $120 per acre. So a big difference in cost, which is why we've kind of moved away from that mix and settled on Chateau as the best option. Unfortunately, neither one of these, none of these products work on nut sedge. There are no effective herbicides registered for nut sedge control in strawberry. Just a real quick blurb on flumioxazem, which is the active ingredient in Chateau. Um, this chart right here, we did this trial a um, short time ago looking at the red, labeled rates, which is 1x, all the way up to ridiculously high rates, something that you would never use. And we were just trying to highlight um, what rate would you have to use to see damage. And we did this across a lot of different sites. And you can see I'm pointing at these dots where the 1x rate, which is 3 ounces per acre, 2x rate or the 4x rate. This is essentially no damage. You have to go all the way up to eight times the label rate to cause damage with Chateau. So it's extremely safe. If you do get damage, this is what it looks like. Chateau, if you get it on the bed and it up, comes up through the roots, you can see the browning on the veins. That's what Chateau will do. It'll burn the veins up and of course that leaf will die. If you have real high rates, um, the plant is not likely going to recover. This graph is Chateau persistence over the season. And I know it goes up a little bit here, but this is just kind of a little bit of accumulation effect. But basically the reason we like Chateau is because of the fact it persists throughout our season. So it's a really good product. Just a couple of things. Um, strawberries are extremely tolerant of Chateau. You can apply it, don't of course, but you, we went up to four times the label right without any damage. It persists for the whole season. That's a good thing, unless you're gonna use that plastic for a second crop, then that could be a problem for you. Um, I have gone to a few fields over the last few years where we um, saw some Chateau damage and the three bullet points in the bottom here, these are the three reasons we've seen damage. Number one, inadequate agitation in the tank. So Chateau right now is a granular, although that formulation is changing. And there's been cases where people didn't agitate it. You get all of a sudden you release a clump of herbicide in the middle of the field and you get a, you know, a spot where you get some damage. You have an inexperienced driver who slows down near the end of the row and all of a sudden you get really high rates near the end of the row, that can happen. Or Chateau is supposed to be put on the top of the bed right before you lay the plastic. 
there's been a few people spray it on the flat and then pull that bed up and you end up with the concentrated lines of herbicide right where the plants are. And that also can cause damage. Uh, most of the herbicides that are used in strawberries are used in the row middles. Um, and that's pretty well every single grower does apply herbicides in the row middles in Florida, except for the organic growers, which tend to rely on cultivation. We've done a lot of trials in different crops, looking at which herbicides are the most effective. And this is just a table showing two different seasons. And this was weed um, density in the row middle. And you can see Chateau consistently dropped weed death density significantly. Dual Chateau and Dual and Gold did fairly well, but not really any, any better than Chateau alone. I mentioned Dual because it's recently been registered in strawberries in Florida. I don't believe it's registered in Alabama, but I'll just, we're, we can use it in the row middle. I'm not 100% sure of the in Alabama. Um, this is an example of a row metal. This is, again, this particular one was in tomatoes, but you can see non-treated versus a Chateau application. We had Gramoxyl mixed there to burn down what was green and, and big difference. So really, really good um, control. This, um, this is just a summary of the most effective options and the most common used ones in Florida. So a lot of growers will, before transplant, will use a combination of AIM and Chateau to burn down what's there and to give them residual control or germoxone and Chateau. Few will use Gold and germoxone, and there are a few that use glyphosate. After transplant, there are a lot of growers that use glyphosate or uh, germoxone plus Chateau mix that can be sprayed up to fruit set, but not after. Just a couple of things of warning. With Chateau, if you spray it um, in row middles, it does persist a long time, that's its strength, um, but you can, there's a risk of if you have a sandy soil like we do in Florida and you get a lot of wind, where you can actually have particles of sand blow up into the fruit if you wait too long to apply that application, you get little burn marks. So something you don't wanna to go too close to when you think you're gonna be picking. With glyphosate, really common problem is um, this yellowing, this is a little bit of drift when they were spraying it. This is very typical of glyphosate or Roundup damage and strawberries where you see the growing points and even the buds down here all kind of turn of a yellowy twin, yellowy twin. So you need to be careful if you're using glyphosate after transplant, careful to do everything you can to minimize drift. Um, I'm gonna mention this particular species because we historically did not have ragweed parthenium in our strawberries. It started down south of Florida. It has since moved rapidly northward. Um, now I pretty much see it in all of our strawberry fields. A lot of people mix it up with common ragweed and really easy to tell them apart. If you look at this picture, uh, ragweed parthenium has white veins, which common ragweed does not. And common ragweed, if you look at the top, that's common ragweed, a little bit more finely divided leaf. Of course, the dead giveaway is these small white flowers look like little puff clouds. Um, and then you have um, also the, the vein as these really, uh, sorry, the stem as these really prominent veins. So why, why we're concerned about ragweed parthenium and why I'm mentioning it today is we've seen consistently it's moving rapidly northward. And this is what it looks like just a couple of days ago in some fields where they had terminated with herbicides. And you can see the ragweed parthenium is happily still growing. It's very tolerant of glyphosate, and very tolerant, tolerant of germoxone. So it will happily grow. And if you don't control those few that are left, this is a pepper field just south of me. And you can see these white lines. That is it filling the row middles between these rows of peppers. And it's very difficult to manage. In strawberries, you only have two options at the moment. One is Chateau, again, this is the number of weeds per pot. So we're looking at the effects of these herbicides on controlling pre-emerge. So putting it down before the weed comes up. And this NTC is a non-treated control. And then you see three and six ounces of Chateau give really good control. They won't control to 100%, but they do certainly reduce the density. After that, the only options is hand pulling, hoeing, or cultivation. There are no herbicides that can be used um, within the strawberry crop to control the species. We do have some products that are working 
And uh, we have spent some time um, try, working on getting a label for those and strawberries. And that, that will be a national label um, once we make a little bit more progress. So something to consider with this species. If you do see it in strawberry fields, it tends to start on the edges, on the field edges. Um, you need to make sure you remove it. Now in Florida, we usually terminate all strawberries at some point, either with a herbicide or with a fumigant herbicide, of course, being the most common um, approach and KPAM or VAPAM being the ones that are used the most often. So this is just a series of pictures where we looked at different rates of, in this case, it's KPAM, VAPAM, basically you get the same data and looking at how much it takes to kill strawberries. This is at the end of the season, you want to inject KPAM. And the advantage of doing this is that you not only terminate the strawberries, but you kill the weeds. And you also kill seeds in the soil and pathogens and nematodes. So at 10 gallons per acre, you can see with well, this red box that perfectly good um, strawberry control at a very low rate of 10 gallons per acre. So if you have a nice clean field, and not really any pest pressure, and you just want to terminate your crop, this could be an option, although it's going to be more expensive than herbicides. However, if you go to a part of your field where you have a lot of nut sedge, which is the case in this picture, and I'm just using nut sedge because you can visually see the difference, at 10 gallons per acre, you still have a lot of green weeds growing because you don't, there's not as much spread and there just isn't as, you get control in the center, this is with one drip tape, but you're not getting control in the bed edges. If you up it to 40 gallons per acre, there's still a little bit of green, but you get much, much better control and um, overall weed control, which means it's gonna, if it will kill nut sedge on the edges, it's killing other pests that also occur on the bed edges. Um, we use this type of technique if we have issues with these diseases like charcoal rot and strawberry, this can be an effective way to minimize um, chance of infection the following year. We've done a lot of studies looking at um, rates. So you can see this is a non-treated and petri dishes, these black dots, this is actually macrophemina growing in the petri dish. At 10 gallons per acre, you drop it in the center, but the side's still pretty bad. 20 gallons per acre, similar story. 30 gallons per acre, acre. this yellow is not um, macrophemina, this is a, a different organism that's not of concern but you're still not reaching the side. At 40 gallons per acre, you start to get much better control. So crop termination with APAM helps with diseases, but it also helps with weeds. So for example, the most common weed we have in strawberries in Florida is goosegrass. And if you look at this chart here, this is the dose of metam potassium or KPAM. This is percent control. And you can see, and this is control not of the plants, this is control of the seeds. And this is why it's really important is you can get significant kill of a seed bank with a good application of something like KPAM. And this rate right around here will be equivalent to 40 gallons per acre, which means that around 40 gallons per acre, you're gonna get decent control of seeds. Uh, common purslane, another weed that we have a lot of, this would be a very similar trend. You can see decent control of it application of KPAM. So summary 10 gallons per acre will adequately terminate a strawberry crop, but you need much higher rates right around 40 gallons per acre, acre if you want to optimize weed control and control of a lot of pathogens like macrophemina. I do want to mention a fallow program. So our season, of course, is a little different than yours, but generally speaking, we are fumigating and, and putting beds in, in August. We plant in September and we're harvesting through till March or April, depending on markets and, and things like that. That means we have a fallow program in from April all the way through to the following June, um, or April, May and June, sometimes in July. And then perhaps part of August. So several months there where we have bare ground. A little over 80%, somewhere around 85% of the strawberry acreage is cover crop every year. Um, there's a lot of important reasons for us to do that. That's our wettest time of the year. So cover crops help with things like erosion um, and helping improve a water uptake for our aquifers. But 
Cover crops also do inhibit weeds. You can see this picture on the right-hand side look, taken underneath the canopy. Um, you see hardly, almost no weed seeds germinating there. So good cover crop inhibits weed growth and suppresses weed seed production. And can't emphasize the importance of, you know, there's all kinds of reasons to cover crop for soil structure, for soil health. But just in terms of weed control, you can really reduce um, weed growth and prevent seed production with a properly managed cover crop. Now that's true for broadleaf weeds and it's true for grass seeds. And actually we, in some of our long-term trials, the presence or absence of a good fallow program, whether that's cover crops or herbicides, was more important than deciding which fumigant to use. That just kind of gives you an idea of how important a good fallow program is. That decision of what to grow when you didn't have strawberries there had a, a much greater effect on the, what, the number of weeds than even what fumigant you selected. When it comes to nut sedge management, cover crops are not a good option. And the reason for that is nut sedge will happily grow underneath the canopy of even the most dense cover crops. This is a picture of sun hemp. Even under sun hemp, which can form an incredibly thick canopy, cover, um, nut sedge will continue to happily grow. Now it won't produce as many tubers, so you do prevent your populations from getting bigger, which is good, but you don't reduce the population. So if you have a field with a nut sedge problem, you're much better off to use something like cultivation and glyphosate combinations. So basically what you wanna do is you wanna allow the nut sedge to grow. You wanna spray um, glyphosate when you have uh, nut sedge about, I don't know, seven inches tall, be certainly before it flowers. Then you wanna cultivate to stimulate more um, sprouting and then spray again. Doing that a couple of times will optimize your nut sedge control. So that kind of gives you a summary of the overall um, approach to weed control. Uh, there's one other thing I want to cover here shortly, but again, I want to emphasize the one thing that we have know for certain is that effective weed control over long term is you've got to integrate more than one tool at a time. And one of the reasons that we don't have as many issues with herbicide resistance, for example, in many specialty crops like strawberries is because we have historically used very integrated weed management programs. So you want to continue to make sure that you do that. We, um, last few years, we've been doing something kind of fun. I'm just gonna mention this quickly. Uh, here in Florida, we do this practice of, of relay cropping where we plant a second crop into our strawberries. So um, in this case, you can see ag plants growing in strawberries. What would happen is somewhere around January, which is when we're full out harvesting strawberries, they will come through and they'll plant ag plants, cantaloupes, or peppers in down the center of the bed. So we grow two rows of strawberries in one bed with one drip tape down the center. So they'll plant a second crop right down the center along the side of that drip tape. And then when it comes near the end of the strawberry season, the standard practice right now would be to remove those strawberries by hand and allow that second crop to grow. So the advantage and the reason they do relay cropping versus terminating the strawberries and then planting a second crop is all about timing. It allows them to get another crop to market sooner um, without the gap between when one crop ends and another one starts. And um, so there's that, there's that advantage of timing. The strawberries do provide some protection. So it allows you to get Basically, it allows you to get two crops in a time period when you normally couldn't get them because for part of that time, they're growing together. The downside of this approach is, that, as you can imagine, hand removal of strawberries is labor intensive. So we started um, developing this shield, which is really very simple. This is just a prototype. It's basically a triangular shield that you can adjust the width at the bottom. And then on the outside and each side, we have nozzles. I'll just show you the back of it as well. And we have it at the front is kind of flanged out slightly. So what it does is as you pull through the field, in this case, I'm showing it with ag plants again, it pulls the leaves of the ag plant up and into this triangular shield. And then you're spraying the herbicide on the outside to kill the strawberries. So when you pass an open area, 
you can see this dry line down the center of the bed. That's where the herbicide didn't touch, which is, and your plant is covered. And then this wet area on the outside, both sides, that's where the herbicide would have been sprayed. So what this looks like is right here. Um, the strawberries eventually die and you are, continue to grow. In this case, we were testing hand removal versus herbicide removal in eggplants. We've done it in cantaloupes and we've also done it in peppers. Uh, not a great idea for cantaloupes, but for peppers, anything growing upright like peppers and eggplants is a great idea. It works really well and um, no, no effects on yield. As a matter of fact, if you plant the second crop at the right time, you actually get a bit of a yield boost. Um, just because, as I started to mention earlier, the strawberries provide some level of protection against cold periods or um, colder weather or wind. So with that, I, I wanna, I know I've gone kind of long already and I wanna make sure if there's any questions, there's a chance to ask those, but um, I wanna acknowledge I've got a great team down here. There's a lot of, there's a lot of this work for me and we are funded by the Florida Strawberry Growers Association, as well as the Florida Department of Agriculture.